years It don't mean a thing If it ain't got that swing The charm of philosophical psychology Most of you who follow my videos have probably already surmised that I'm an aficionado of philosophical psychology. In other words, I like to pursue psychology in a philosophical way. Or maybe it's that I like to pursue philosophy in a psychological way. I'm never really sure what it is. But in any case, I like to hybridize the projects of psychology and philosophy and to seek after a kind of synthesis whose advantages are greater than those inherent in either psychology or philosophy alone. And it's probably also apparent what kinds of philosophy I personally prefer. It's mostly phenomenology, existentialism, and Buddhist philosophies, although I do have something of a soft spot for post-structuralism, too. From the psychological side of the aisle, I favor post-positivistic modes of psychology, such as humanistic and psychoanalytic psychologies. Anyhow, in this video, I'd like to describe why I like philosophical psychology of these types so much. However, before getting into that, it's probably good to acknowledge that to many people, the project of synthesizing philosophy and psychology amounts to a kind of apostasy. For instance, for people who like to approach psychology rigidly from the paradigm of the natural sciences, incorporating philosophical insight seems like an unwarranted and irresponsible intrusion into psychology's proper ambit. On the other hand, people of a philosophical persuasion tend to see incorporating psychological insights as a corruption of philosophy's proper project. However, I personally prefer to dwell exactly at their point of intersection, where neither project remains pure and unadulterated. Part of the reason why I like to do that has to do with overcoming the deficiencies I detect in the pure forms of psychology and philosophy, respectively. In my view, the problem with a pure, unphilosophical approach to psychology is that it very quickly tends to degenerate into a kind of mechanical, objectivistic rationalism animated largely by a problem-solving impulse. In other words, a lot of it deteriorates into what I like to call so-what psychology, an enterprise that generates plenty of factually correct assertions but whose truths often seem so technical and trivial that they lack enough evocative poetic resonance to call us into the broader and deeper sea of life. Personally, I find that there's something about philosophical insights that helps keep psychology trained on the big, important questions and issues, the kind in which we all have a vital stake. However, on the other side of the divide, the problem with a pure, unpsychological approach to philosophy is that it, too, usually degenerates, but this time into a kind of anemic, intellectualized dissection of abstract concepts that bears little relation to the gritty flesh-and-blood task of meeting life's immediate demands. In this case, I find that there's something about psychology's insistence on dealing with actual human beings and their problems that helps counterbalance that tendency. However, it seems to me that these two respective problems also share a common root. In my view, both problems are ultimately expressions of a truncated vision of what intellectual understanding is in the first place. A vision that has largely estranged itself from the longings of the human heart and that consequently generates a kind of triviality and or insularity that's at odds with the deeper possibilities of human self-understanding. But of course, in that case, the question then naturally becomes, how might we begin to refashion things in a way that avoids some of these pitfalls and that aligns our attempts to understand ourselves more faithfully with the reality we're actually experiencing? As you might infer at this point, I personally find that hybridizing psychology with philosophy is a good first step toward addressing at least some of these problems. On one hand, I find that philosophy tends to provide a corrective to psychology's unfortunate inclination toward a dull, objectivistic pragmatism. On the other hand, I find that psychology provides a corrective to philosophy's unfortunate penchant for desiccated intellectualization. In other words, I find that the synthesis of psychology and philosophy produces advantages that neither one possesses on its own. It produces a hybridized mode of understanding that is at once intellectually acute, and at the same time, full of exuberance and human passion, and that can consequently provide a real entry into the greater depth of life. 
But, of course, engaging in this kind of synthesis requires transgressing against what would otherwise be the purism of disciplinary boundaries. And that's why I've come to appreciate an impure approach to both psychology and philosophy. It's because an impure approach, the kind that strategically flouts disciplinary boundaries, seems to reflect how life actually is most of the time. Fraught with ambiguities, imprecision, imperfections, and deceptions of every variety. Of course, this makes the task of human self-understanding much more messy and complex, but it also makes it much more interesting and adventuresome, and much more powerful, too, at least in my view. However, I'm also an empirist with respect to the cultural and historical origins of the kind of philosophy I prefer. With respect to Western philosophy, as I mentioned earlier, I'm partial to what's known as continental philosophy, and especially to phenomenology and existentialism. However, I like to take up their insights from a distinctly American perspective. To me, cross-fertilizing a very European way of understanding life with a distinctly American sensibility is far better than either approach on its own. And here again, I feel this way partly because of the weaknesses I've detected in the two respective approaches taken on their own. Basically, The weakness of 20th century continental philosophy is its tendency to indulge in a kind of elitist obscuritanism fueled by the enticements of intellectual celebrity as it plays out in Europe, which is almost a kind of non sequitur from the perspective of an American sensibility. Basically, the problem with continental thought is that it's often subject to the dynamics of the emperor's new clothes. Its strength, however, lies in the subtlety and incisiveness of its insights. In contrast, the American approach to philosophical questions is much less intellectually elitist and much more egalitarian. Basically, we Americans expect insights to be accessible not only to the conoscenti, but to the majority. And if they aren't, we tend to view them somewhat dismissively as intellectualized claptrap. Basically, we tend to follow Einstein's dictum that if you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. However, the weakness of the American approach lies in its relative superficiality. Basically, what the American approach gains in egalitarian accessibility, it loses in the depth and power of its insights. And what the European approach gains in trenchancy, it loses in accessibility. Consequently, To me, the most exciting locus for taking up phenomenological and existential questions is exactly where European incisiveness meets American accessibility. But this, too, necessitates letting go of whatever allegiance we feel toward either a purely European or a purely American approach. And finally, it seems to me that an impure approach is best with respect to the divide that usually separates Western philosophy from its Eastern counterpart. My sense is that Western philosophy has been pretty good at exploring the meaning and sensibility of many parts of life, but its weakness is that it only rarely offers us any kind of concrete praxis that we can then incorporate into our lives. As Marx once famously noted, the philosophers have only interpreted the world in various ways. The point, however, is to change it. On the other hand, with regard to Eastern thinking, my own interest is focused mostly on Buddhism. The strength of a Buddhist approach is its emphasis on offering us a concrete praxis, most especially in the form of meditation, but also in the form of practicing mindfulness, compassion, and skillful means in our everyday lives. So, here too it seems that conjoining Western and Eastern thinking yields an impure synthesis that's superior to either approach on its own. A synthesis that yields a way of understanding the world that is, at the same time, a way of engaging the world. At the same time, though, I believe that for some people, an unadulterated devotion to a single way of understanding life is probably what's best. That's because what we need in life varies a lot from person to person and also from one point in our lives to another. So, what's advantageous for one person can easily be disadvantageous for another. So, I'm hoping that the main motif of this video, that of impurity, isn't coming off as some kind of nomothetic pronouncement, which would paradoxically cast impurity as a new form of purism. It's just that that's what seems to work best for me, and for a fair number of people I've met along the way. 
basically, my own experience has shown me that I prefer a somewhat messy and imperfect and impure understanding of life, mostly because, as I've said, life seems to be that way. It's also the reason why I don't regard myself as being a genuine adherent of any of the approaches I love. Not a Buddhist and not an existentialist. Not an American and not a pseudo-European. Not a psychologist and not a philosopher. The deeper reality is that these kinds of categories always seem to fall short of capturing all of the terror and wonderment of human existence. Anyhow, it seems to me that dilettantism is a tremendously underrated approach to life. So, in my heart of hearts, I don't actually regard myself as being anything at all, other than another human being wandering life's expanses of time and space. A kind of nomad, I suppose, who's trying his best to understand things as deeply as possible and to make a decent contribution to the universe at the same time. Perhaps, as Duke Ellington once observed, the whole point is to live beyond category. Yes, it don't mean a thing if it ain't got that swing. Don't mean a thing All you got to do is sing